oxytocin or pitocin. It is a nonopeptide drug which was first discovered in the early 1900s and it was then approved for the use in humans in the late 1950s and 1960s. It was primarily used for induction of labor, augmentation of labor, for the use of first or second trimester abortions and but mainly it was used for the prevention of postpartum hemorrhage or PPH. PPH is one of the major leading cause of maternal mortality in India. And there have been several drugs that have been introduced after oxytocin, like methergin, carboprost. But there has been a new drug which has now been introduced in the market, which is a pa new paradigm in the PPH prevention, which is known as carbitocin. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today I'll be presenting a presentation on carbitocin, which is a new drug, something which gynecologists and obstetricians around the country need to know for the prevention and management of postpartum hemorrhage. The table of contents, the aims and objectives of today's presentation will be postpartum hemorrhage, a brief introduction and epidemiology. Causes of postpartum hemorrhage, the four T's as we all know, the tone, the tissue, the trauma and the coagulopathy. Uh, guidelines in the management of postpartum hemorrhage, this is a pharmacological management. Carbitocin pharmacology, pharmacology of carbitocin, the mechanism of action is pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. The dosage and indication in the clinical studies. Now what is postpartum hemorrhage? The WHO defines PPH or postpartum hemorrhage as any blood loss which is more than equal to 500 ml within 24 hours of birth in a normal vaginal delivery or more than 1000 ml after a caesarean section. The ACOG defines PPH a blood loss which is greater than or equal to 1000 ml or blood loss which is accompanied by signs or symptoms of hypovolemia. PPH causes 4 out of 10 maternal deaths in India which is a very very high cause and hence I am doing this presentation today for us to increase our knowledge for the presentation and prevention of postpartum hemorrhage. PPH impact on maternal mortality. A quarter of all maternal deaths worldwide, PPH accounts for 35 to 56 percent of maternal deaths in India. The five most common direct causes of maternal related death in India were hemorrhage, unsafe abortions, sepsis, hypertensive disorders like preeclampsia and eclampsia, and obstructed labor. The highest being postpartum hemorrhage, which is 38 percent. Now, there are two types of postpartum hemorrhage one is primary, and the second is secondary. Primary is a major cause of mortality and morbidity within the first 24 hours of delivery and secondary is after 24 hours but within 12 weeks postnatally. India, the prevalence is 2 to 4 percent for vaginal deliveries and around 6 to 8 percent for cesarean deliveries. A small blood loss that makes a woman hemodynamically unstable in terms of her blood pressure, her pulse or her general condition which is unstable is also termed as a postpartum hemorrhage. It may not have to arbitrarily be 500 ml or 1000 ml. Now talking about the etiology and risk factors in postpartum hemorrhage. Like I said, there are four T's. There is tone, tissue, trauma and thrombin. In tone, there is uterus over distension, uterus muscle fatigue, there is uterine infection or chorioamnitis, uterine distortion or uterine relaxing drugs. In tissue, there is retained placenta or membranes, incomplete delivery of the placenta. In trauma, there could be cervical, vaginal or perineal tears. There could be extension tears at the time of caesarean section. There could be uterine ruptures or uterine inversion. And in thrombin, there is coagulopathy. And uterine atonia, as we know, is the most common cause of postpartum hemorrhage, which leads to around 50 to 60 percent of EPH. Now, what are the risk factors for postpartum hemorrhage? The etiology, primary problem, and the risks and signs. The abnormalities of the uterine contraction, that is atonia, that is a problem in the contraction of the uterus. So, the primary problem could be four. It could be either atonic uh, uterus, it could be an over distension of the uterus, it could be a fibroid uterus, or uterine inversion. So, the risk factors for atonia could be a prolonged use of oxytocin, high parity, like multiparity chorioamnionitis or general anesthesia. General anesthesia causes relaxation of drugs due to CO fluorin. Over distension of the uterus could be because of twins or multiple gestation, could be polyhydromnios or could be a big baby or macrosomia. Fibroid uterus could be multiple fibroids, mainly submucous and intermural fibroid and uterine inversion because of excessively long uh, umbilical cord because of cord traction or early traction of the cord. Now the genital tract trauma, it could be because of episiotomy, it could be cervical, vaginal and perineal tears or it could be uterine rupture. The risk factors will become operative vaginal deliveries or precipitous uh, delivery. Precipitous delivery is basically when the entire first stage and second stage of labor is completed within 3 to 4 hours. It is mainly seen in multiparous pregnancies. Retained placental tissues could be retained placenta or placenta accreta or placenta accreta spectrum. Um, the risk factors becoming previous uterine surgeries or incomplete delivery of the placenta. And abnormalities of the coagulation is because of preeclampsia, severe infection, amniotic fluid, embolism or any therapeutic anticoagulation that can be given. It could also be because of abnormal bruising, because of fetal death, placental abruption, fever, sepsis, hemorrhage or recurrent thromboembolic infections. Blood loss can be estimated by weighing of compresses or the cloth that we use, the visual estimation, collecting devices or calculation of shock index which is OSI which is obstetric shock index. The severity of the condition can be estimated by either blood loss of more than 500 ml in which the condition is abnormal, more than 1000 ml which is defined as a severe postpartum hemorrhage or more than 2000 ml which is defined as a massive hemorrhage. Now we are talking about a few guidelines in the management of postpartum hemorrhage. 
coming to the RCOG 2016 guidelines, talking about carbitocin first. A statistically significant reduction was seen in the need for further eutrotonics compared with oxytocin for those undergoing a cesarean section but not for vaginal delivery. And no statistically significant differences were seen between carbitocin and oxytocin in terms of the risk of postpartum hemorrhage. Guidelines for the SEOG, which is the uh, Society of Obstetrics and Gynecology of Canada, recommended that carbitocin, 100 micrograms given as an IV bolus over one minute, should be used for the prevention of PPH in the elective cesarean deliveries. All these are level 1, 2 plus guidelines. Now, WHO has come out with a 2018 update, which talks about the prevention and the treatment of postpartum hemorrhage. Now, what works? The efficacy and the safety of uterotonic drugs for the postpartum prevention. The use of effective uterotonic for the prevention of PPH during the third stage of labor is recommended for all births, irrespective of whether it is vaginal delivery or caesarean section. Now, various drugs are available, like I already mentioned. There is oxytocin, the new drug carbitocin, mesoprostol, ergometrin or methyl ergometrin or methergin, like we commonly say, oxytocin and methergin, fixed drug combination like symptometrin. And uh, the use of carbitocin at 100 microgram IV or IM is recommended for the prevention of postpartum hemorrhage for all births in context where the cost is comparable to other effective oxytocin drugs, vaginal or cesarean births or for prevention of postpartum hemorrhage only. Now the ACOG 2017 guidelines, uh, the 181 ACOG practice bulletin also talks about the postpartum hemorrhage. Now the 2017 PPH guidelines of ACOG talks about the acute medical management of postpartum hemorrhage. Oxytocin can be given as a dose or root of intravenous that can be 10 to 40 units for 500 to 1000 ml as continuous infusion or an intramuscular of 10 units given after the delivery of the anterior shoulder. The frequency of it is a continuous infusion. Or you can use methyl ergometrin which can be given as an intramuscular injection of 0.2 mg every 2 to 4 hourly or carbopros which is 15 methyl PG F2 alpha as an intramuscular 250 micrograms or an intramyometrial 250 micrograms every 15 to 90 minutes a maximum of 8 doses can be given and mesoprostol 600 to 1000 micrograms per rectal, oral or subliquid, a single dose. Now, what is the international consensus statement on the use of uterotonic drugs during a caesarean delivery? Carbitocin is a long-acting analogue of oxytocin with a similar mechanism of action and an adverse drug effect profile. The increased duration of action of carbitocin compared with oxytocin eliminates the use of continuous infusion after an initial dose. It may therefore become a first-line drug in the future, preferred over oxytocin. Now, the FIGO 2021 FIGO and ICM strongly recommended the use of uterotonics during the active management of third stage of labor to prevent postpartum hemorrhage during a vaginal or a caesarean delivery. The recommendations are in alignment with the 2018 WHO guidelines. Now, FOXI, that is the Federation of Obstetrics and Gynecology Society of India, it recommends active management to prevent postpartum hemorrhage in caesarean deliveries. Oxytocin, that is IM or IV diluted, is recommended uterotonic drug for the prevention of postpartum hemorrhage in a caesarean section. Now, what they have given in the table is the same as the WHO guidelines. Now, the AICOG 2019 now talks about the carbitocin in atonic postpartum hemorrhage. The total duration of a single injection of intravenous carbitocin on the uterine activity is about one hour. Hence, only a single drug use is sufficient for carbitocin. Carbitocin has a potent uterotonic effect on the pregnant and immediate postpartum uterus and has no effect on a non-gravid uterus. The bioavailability is also pretty high, it is 75 to 80%. So, talking about specifically for carbitocin, just a long-acting oxytocin? Although oxytocin is the most commonly and widely used agent, there are several limitations for this as compared to the newer agents which are available. Now, what are the limitations of oxytocin? The major limitation it is has a very, very short half-life of 3 to 17 minutes. A continuous IV infusion is necessary to achieve a sustained uterotonic activity. For elective caesarean section, a slow 0.3 to 1 use of oxytocin over a minute, followed by infusion of 10 units per hour for 4 hours required for women with a postpartum hemorrhage. Larger doses of oxytocin is associated with adverse side effects like hypertension, nausea, vomiting, dysarrhythmia, ST changes in ECG, pulmonary edema and severe water intoxication with convulsions also. These limitations are targeted by and hence new drug that is carbitocin has been introduced. Now, carbitocin is available as an injection of 100 micrograms per ml. Now, what is the mechanism of action? Carbitocin is a synthetic oxytocin analog that binds to the same myometal receptors as that of oxytocin and has a very similar affinity for it. Long-acting synthetic nonopeptide analogs of oxytocin with an agonist property, carbitocin selectively binds to oxytocin receptors present on the smooth musculature of the uterus, resulting in a rhythmic contraction of the uterus, increased frequency of existing contraction and increased uterine tone. So this has a very good advantage over uh, syntomycin or uh, methyl ergometrin, which causes a dysarrhythmic uterine contraction, which can lead to severe pain and nausea and vomiting in the uh, postpartum period. The plasma half-life is around 40 minutes, which is around 4 to 10 times more than oxytocin. Onset of contraction is just within two minutes and duration of action is about one hour. So the Society of Obstetrics and Gynecology of Canada, that is SOGC, 
recommends oxy uh, carbitocin as its first line eutotonic drug for prevention of PPH in elective caesarean sections. Now talking about the pharmacokinetics, the absorption. The peak concentration is within 20 to 30 minutes, a bioavailability of 75 to 80 percent. The distribution of half-life is five and a half minutes. The metabolism it is primarily by non-renal routes and excretion, the half-life elimination of carbitocin was 41 minutes. Now what is the pharmacodynamics? The plasma half-life is 40 minutes, like I mentioned, it is 4 to 10 times more than that of oxytocin. The onset of contractions within 1 to 2 minutes in 90% of patients. Act, it acts long enough to prevent postpartum hemorrhage in the immediate postpartum period. The duration of action is almost 1 to 2 hours when given either intravenously or intramuscularly respectively. And it has attributed, why this happens is because it has an attribution to a longer half-life of carbitocin as compared to oxytocin. Now, increase in uterine tone and the reduction in the risk of PPH in elective caesarean sections, only a single dose of carbitocin is enough, which is equilibrium to a 16-hour oxytocin infusion. Now, talking about the indications and the dosage, indication is indicated for the prevention of postpartum hemorrhage due to uterine atoning. Now, the caesarean section under epidural or spinal anesthesia it can be used. Withdraw 1 ml of carbitocin, which is around 100 micrograms, and administer by intravenous injection over 1 minute. Now, method of administration is intravenous. Carbitocin must only be administered after the delivery of the infant, as soon as possible after delivery, preferably before the delivery of the placenta. For intravenous administration of carbitocin, must be administered slowly over one minute, and carbitocin is intended for a single use only, and no further doses should be given in carbitocin. Now, talking about something which is very important is contraindications. Uh, unlike oxytocin, this cannot be used for the augmentation or the induction of labor, so it cannot be used during pregnancy. Carbitocin must not be used for the induction of labor. For people who are hypersensitive to oxytocin, but also be hypersensitive to carbitocin, so it is contraindicated in those patients. Hepatic or renal disease, severe ca cardiovascular disorders like a severe preeclampsia or eclampsia, carbitocin may not be given, and epilepsy. Now, what is the use in special population? Pregnancy, use only during pregnancy prior to the delivery of the infant is contraindicated. In breastfeeding, small amounts of oxytocin are shown to pass from plasma into the breast milk of the nursing women, which are assumed to degrade uh, enzymes in the gut. Breastfeeding does not need to have restricted use of carbitocin. In pediatrics, uh, below the age of 18 years, safety and efficacy has still not been established. And over the age of 65, again, it has not been established. Now, what are the drug interactions? No drug interactions have been identified with analgesics, spasmolytics, or drugs which are used for spinal or epidural anesthesia. Due to similarities between oxytocin and carbitocin, occurrence of interaction have known to associate between oxytocin and carbitocin cannot be excluded. Severe hypertension has been reported when oxytocin was given over 3 to 4 hours following a prophylactic administration of vasoconstriction in conjunction with a caudal block anesthesia. May enhance the blood pressure enhancing uh, effect of uh, agor derivatives like ergometrin or methyl ergometrin. Like oxytocin, carbitocin's effect may be potentiated by the use of prostaglandins. Some inhalation anesthesia like halothane and cyclopropane may enhance the hypotensive effect of oxytocin and hence of carbitocin also and arrhythmias have been used have been reported for oxytocin use concomitantly. Now what are the summary of the adverse effects? Uh, divided into system organ classification, ones which are very common and ones which are common. So blood and lymphatic system, uh, commonly anemia may be seen. Uh, nervous system disorders like headache, tremors, dizziness and anxiety. In cardiovascular abnormalities like hypertension, flushing and leading to tachycardia. Respiratory and medical disorders could be chest pain and dyspnea. GI disorders could be nausea, vomiting or abdomen pain or could be metallic taste. And skin and subcutaneous tissue can cause pleuritis. Now, what are the, I'll just be talking of a few points about the clinical studies that have undergone for carbitocin. Now, there was a meta-analysis about carbitocin versus oxytocin for the prevention of postpartum hemorrhage. The main aim of this study was to analyze the effectiveness of carbitocin compared to oxytocin for the prevention of postpartum hemorrhage and caesarean deliveries. Now, what are the materials and the methods that were used? A major electronic database was searched for randomized controlled trials comparing carbitocin and oxytocin involved in caesarean deliveries. Non-randomized trials, non-caesarean deliveries and studies which did not directly impact carbitocin to oxytocin were excluded. Outcomes were analyzed, which were postpartum hemorrhage, additional use of uterotonic and transfusion requirements. So, like we can see, there are many authors which have done these studies uh, in Canada, in the United Kingdom, in Malaysia, in Egypt, and Australia. And uh, they have given a comments about the elective deliveries, elective and caesarean deliveries, and emergency caesarean deliveries. So, what we can see the conclusion, which is the red highlighted point. Uh, basically, there's a comparison between transfusion needed in carbitocin and oxytocin. It was 1.49% in carbitocin and 4.97% oxytocin, almost four times less than carbitocin. And in postpartum hemorrhage, also we can see it was 14.34% in carbitocin and 17.98% in oxytocin. So there's a significant difference between the two. And additional use of uh, eutotonic drugs, it was 19.98% in carbitocin and it was almost 35% in oxytocin, almost double as compared to carbitocin. Now talking about the uh, risk ratio in postpartum hemorrhage of oxytocin and carbitocin, the risk ratio was 0.79 uh, 
with carbitocin with the p value of 0.009 hence uh, the study favors carbitocin and the additional use of eutotonic drug for carbitocin versus oxytocin was less than 0.001 which strongly favors the use of carbitocin and for uh, transfusion needed it was 0.002 which again strongly favors the use of carbitocin as compared to oxytocin so we see the conclusion of the study was carbitocin is effective in reducing the use of additional eutotonics reducing the amount of postpartum hemorrhage and reducing the requirements of further transfusion now there was another review of carbitocin for prevention of postpartum hemorrhage uh, the objective of this was to determine if the use of oxytocin agonist that is carbitocin is as effective as conventional eutotonic drugs for prevention of eph now the search data was a cochrane review uh, medline and embase the selection criteria was rcts which compared carbitocin with other eutotonic drugs and with placebo or no treatment at all and two review authors independently assessed the trials for inclusion and assessment of the bias and the extracted data and the primary outcome was severe postpartum hemorrhage which is defined as a blood loss of more than 1000 mn maternal death or severe morbidity and like we see the highlighted point the outcome was one postpartum hemorrhage in carbitocin so the risk of postpartum hemorrhage was significantly lower in the group which was receiving carbitocin compared to oxytocin with a risk ratio of 0.55 and the outcome for the prevention of postpartum hemorrhage was two uh, additional use of eutotonic drugs so the conclusion was the use of carbitocin compared with oxytocin was associated with a reduced need for subsequent use of eutotonic drugs and there was no difference in the need for blood transfusion between carbitocin and oxytocin with a risk ratio of 0.80 so comparison between carbitocin and oxytocin showed that women who had received carbitocin were less likely to have heavy bleeding that is postpartum hemorrhage and less likely to re require additional eutotonic drugs or even transfusion following cesarean section So there is also a study which was uh, defining the efficacy of carbitocin in prevention of postpartum hemorrhage. I'll just talk about the conclusion of this study. Was carbitocin was effective in reducing the need for additional eutotonic drugs and postpartum blood transfusion in women at an increased risk of postpartum hemorrhage during cesarean deliveries. Okay. So just a brief summary. Carbitocin is a long-acting synthetic oxytocin analog and also works by stimulating the uterus. The guidelines recommend 100 micrograms IV bolus over one minute for the prevention of postpartum hemorrhage and elective cesarean section deliveries. It has a longer half-life as compared to oxytocin, almost four to ten times, which makes it a drug of choice. A single bolus dose to achieve a sustained uterine contraction over one to two hours, and it is effective in reducing the use of additional eutotonic drugs, reducing postpartum hemorrhage, and reducing the need for transfusion in the postpartum period. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.